think what's helpful about the way they go about um, uh, well, there are two things I think are helpful about the way they go about talking about the subject. First of all, I think they uh, uh, immediately uh, recognize that the issue can't be argued theologically, at least, in terms of um, simply issues or perceptions of personal fulfillment uh, on the grounds that our senses of personal fulfillment are damaged owing to sin. Um, uh, and no, nor can they be, uh, are they most properly or most effectively uh, discussed in terms of uh, arguments about whether uh, attraction to persons of same or opposite gender are natural or not. Um, on the grounds, there are lots of things that may be natural that are inappropriate. I mean, there are evidences that alcoholism, for example, is a natural disposition that some people are born with. Um, so uh, they want to really, and, and, and their concern is that each of those ways of looking at the problem are not particularly theological, and that Christians ought to have particularly theological reasons for thinking about and talking about behavior the way they do. And crucial to their common understanding, and one that I uh, put up, what I would want to put up as central, actually they don't use this word, but I think it's a good one, is vocation. Um, that is that the, the onerous debates over whether or not it's sexual orientation or sexual preference or how you want to run it, but in fact, theologically, that's a non-starter. It should be a non-starter for Christians because Christians have never wanted to claim. It's one of the integral features of Christianity that how we're born isn't, a, isn't who we are. That uh, what makes Christians Christians is baptism, which is something that you're never born with, even if it comes very soon thereafter. And that, one's, uh, that, that human destiny is a matter of what God intends for us, and that's something that is, in fact, worked out along the way. Now, it may be, I mean, everybody's different. It may be that one's sense of vocation is marked by a great deal of continuity from birth to death. Or it may be you have all kinds of wild ricochets between different sorts of realities, right? Uh, but nevertheless, in either case, uh, what, God, what, what, is, what, what God is about and what, what uh, uh, we should be about in thinking about our humanity is what God intends for us. And what God intends for us need not be, it isn't a question of worrying about, is this what I was born like or not? Because God certainly works with what you're born with. That's important, but God can do other things with it. Also has, of course, implications for things like transgender identity and stuff like that, right? <clears throat> what, think of that, uh, I, I, mean, I think theologically, I don't want to tell people what they have to think, but as a theologian, um, uh, I would expect that uh, I would want to develop a theology of transgender less in terms of uh, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body or vice versa, as though it were a question of my birth identity being in some tension, but rather a notion of vocation. This is where I started, but this is where God wants me to be. And I think about it in those terms. I mean, I think, again, that's, I mean, uh, not everybody has to be a Christian or think about it in those terms, but as a Christian, that seems to be an appropriate, helpful way to think about it. So I would want to put the, I, I, I think, first of all, framing uh, the discussion in terms of vocation uh, gets around a lot of the invidious problems that can make the discussion of theologies of marriage very sterile and people talking past each other, and one that I think is also uh, coherent with broader Christian senses of uh, what human beings are about. I think it also opens up the fact that we don't simply think in terms of marriage, but we realize there are vocations of singleness. I mean, in fact, Christianity has an enormously rich tradition about this, right? Monasticism. And as uh, Linda Woodhead points out, the generic monasticism is rather unfortunate because, in fact, that covers a whole variety of different ways people have lived out their vocations, some of which are communal, some of which are individual, different kinds of communities, different kinds of services. So it's, it's, a, uh, it's a way of also not being uh, marriage-centric, which is kind of a Protestant sin. Uh, gay or straight, that there's sort of notion that marriage is normative and singleness is abnormal or defective. Uh, so I think that's a, a good place to start. Any questions about that? I don't want to make this a lecture, but I just sort of fall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, you maybe expand a little bit about the whole idea that um, someone might use the idea 
that, well, if you consider yourself born a certain sexuality, that God's calling you to actually correct that and be this other, more normal sexuality. Well, it, I mean, it, it, it could I mean one's vocation. I mean, the fact that I mean one can one can have an identity as straight and, or at least, uh, it be uh, think of oneself as straight, and then through experience decide, no, I'm in fact that's not what my vocation is. One can go the other way around too. I don't want to make it directional, and it may be that one, yeah, one one can change one's mind in all kinds of ways. What I think you want to make it clear of is the notion of normative becomes problematic here, hmm. because what you're defining human reality by is not what has been, but where it's going. And so, what we don't really know what normative is. Does that help? I mean, I, I mean, I, there is, I mean, let, let me use another, another column. <laughs> there are two poles of Christian thinking about the world's destiny, right? Protology, often People just use creation for this, but I, I don't like that because it makes creation tied up with a past event, which is not the best way to think about the doctrine, I think. But protology, origins, okay, or past, and eschatology, future, or end. Okay? And protology is important. I mean, a lot of who we are is a function of where we've been, both as a species and as individuals, right? That's not that's non-controversial, I hope, right? Um, <laughs> but the point is, is this, and here's the question is. It is this category that tends to be troped as normative. Biology is destiny, right? And it seems to be that's crippling however one thinks of oneself and one's future, okay? So I think one wants to take this very seriously, but to recognize that for Christians, you know, we don't, you know, 1 John 3, right? Uh, we don't know what we're going to be like, but we know when he appears, we'll be like him, but we'll see him as he is. Right? Or our Colossians, right? Our lives are hidden with Christ in God. So there's a hiddenness that needs to be revealed, and that takes time. Okay, so the time, I mean, another thing about this that's important, I think, from a Christian, just general thinking about stuff perspective is, if you go this way, if you put all your eggs in this as being determinative, all history is, all your biography is, is a problem. Right? It's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an infinite set of opportunities to fall away from what you want, from, what, from, your, from your reality. Right? Whereas if you put your eggs here, which is what I think scripture does, then history actually becomes functional. <laughs> it's about your moving, moving stuff out. Now, uh, I mean, one, one of the problems, particularly with the way in the West, under the influence of Augustine particularly, uh, is we've we tended to be, the Western tradition has been to sort of idealize um, uh, the paradise story as being a, you know, Adam and Eve were perfect. They didn't have any disease, they didn't have any problems, they were wise, they had much more knowledge than we have now, and so on and so forth. And, 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 and if nothing had happened, they would have simply sort of stayed there. But where could they go? They were perfect already. And then get lifted up at the end into glory, right? Uh, so the only occasion for history is sin, which is not a very nice thought, right? If one has a more dynamic sense of the way in which God sets things up, you get this in Irenaeus of Lyon and in other uh, uh, writers, um, there's an idea that, hum that God always intended human beings to grow, to change, that there was always a trajectory implicit in human existence. Uh, what has happened, sin has made that more complex than it would otherwise have been and more painful, but that there would be a natural movement that we, that we were never to be defined by how we started, is an important strand of Christian tradition that I think is helpful to recall in these contexts. So, vocation goes with, and that's an emphasis on vocation, goes with an emphasis on, on eschatology on the end as being definitive for determining not only who, what your own individual calling is, but what humanity means. I mean, that what we understand by the hum, human nature is in fact in process, because human nature is still being revealed as new people come into existence. Right? Sir? I hear what you're saying, and I'm following you. Um, but how do you deal with the sin factor? Well, sin, sin again uh, complexifies this, because now we have a situation where uh, human beings uh, uh, and aren't simply, a, it isn't simply a matter of human beings going from uh, uh, 
you know, from immature 